Hi, I'm Kate, and on this episode of Bite Size, we're exploring ice cream. And specifically, one component that's in all ice cream and is key to the perfect scoop. Any guesses what that might be? Here's a hint. It's not on the ingredient label, and it's free. It's air. Now, at first, it might seem weird to think that air actually makes up a good portion of this pint, but then if you take a step back and think about it, it makes sense because without air, this would basically be a big block of ice that wouldn't be very enjoyable to eat and would be impossible to scoop. The way we add air to most ice creams is through mechanical action or movement like churning. And even in an ice cream like a no churn ice cream, you still have mechanical action like making whipped cream like you see here and then folding it in. So every ice cream is going to have some air, but we did some research and found that the range is actually really big. Ice cream can have anywhere from 30 to 50% air, and that's what we're going to explore today. So let's start experimenting and seeing how air affects the texture of ice cream. We got a wide variety in brands and flavors, although we tried to stay away from ice creams that had a lot of other components in them, like caramel, which actually made it really hard to find a good Ben & Jerry's flavor, not gonna lie. Our experiment was to see how the amount of air impacts the texture of the ice cream. One of the biggest challenges we had in designing this experiment was to make it as measurable and consistent as possible, which actually was pretty hard. So why were we so focused on having measurable data? Well, it's all about this idea of qualitative versus quantitative data. Quantitative data is data rooted in numbers and measurements, like the ice cream has a mass of 40 grams. Whereas qualitative data is data that uses observations and senses, like the ice cream appears light and porous and I can see tiny holes in it. While both definitely have value, the issue with qualitative observations is that they are subjective. What I may consider light, someone else may not, which is why we wanted to use quantitative observations, observations that are measurable and have clear numbers and values. By using a scale, there's not really any room for interpretation on the overall weight of this ice cream. Ideally, we all have the same exact value, but that's also making some assumptions and assuming that there's no human error or limitations, which also just isn't really the reality in this type of experiment. So based on our question, our independent variable was the amount of air in ice cream. We wanted to see the effect of air on the ice cream texture. So the amount of air is our independent variable, which is a variable that's tested in an experiment to see how it affects another variable also known as the dependent variable. And in this case, our dependent variable is the texture of the ice cream. All right, let's get back to the experiment. So based on our question, our independent variable, which is the variable that we're testing to see if it has an effect on another variable, is the amount of air in ice cream. We wanted to see the effect air had on the ice cream texture. And so our dependent variable is the texture of the ice cream. Sometimes we think of independent and dependent variables as cause and effect. So in this scenario, the cause is the air in the ice cream and the effect is the texture. Now that we have our variables set, let's think about how we're going to measure both of them. Let's start off with independent variable, the amount of air in ice cream. So how would we measure the amount of air in each different type of ice cream? Well, there's probably a variety of ways to do this, but here's how we decided to do ours. So we decided to measure the density of each ice cream. Why density? Well, air is a gas and it's super light. So a food that has a lot of air, like marshmallows, is also going to be light because of the amount of air in it and so it won't be very dense. Our thinking was that if the ice cream had a low density, it was probably due to the percentage of air in it. So to measure density, we needed both the mass and volume of each ice cream. So we took a single scoop, a consistent volume of ice cream, and measured out the mass of each one. So in theory, this sounds great, but practically it did not really work the way that we intended. Because the ice cream was so frozen, we could barely even scoop it out. And so the scooper was definitely not full and we weren't actually getting a consistent volume. So we needed to rethink things. Our second idea was weighing out each pint. We figured the volume was consistent because the manufacturer had filled the pint. And so we could just weigh out the pint of each one. However, this also had some shortcomings because the container also had mass. We did weigh out two containers and saw that they had the same amount of mass, but we didn't weigh out all of them. So we also felt like this actually wasn't great either. So we actually went back to the original method, but this time we decided to keep the ice cream out for a little bit longer. So it was easier to scoop and a little bit softer. So the ice cream soup was actually pretty full and we felt like the volume was a lot more consistent. Was it perfect? No, 
which is why we went through one more set of data, which is the Nutrition Facts label. What did the manufacturer say the mass was of a single scoop? Now they do have it as two thirds of a cup and our scooper was a quarter cup, so we had to do some conversions, but here you can see all of our data. So there were some differences in our measured value of a quarter cup of a scoop of ice cream versus what the label said, but it was at least a consistent difference. Our measured value for almost all the ice creams was consistently a little bit higher than what the label said. While it wasn't perfect, we felt like between all of our different sets of data, we were able to have a clear grouping of ice creams from most mass to less mass to least mass. Wait, but why are we measuring mass if we're trying to measure density? Well, the key is, is that we were trying to have our volume consistent, so the measure of the mass was actually reflecting the density. Let's look at this a little bit more closely to understand this. If we take two different pints of ice cream, they have the same volume, which is one pint. And so whichever one has more mass is going to be more dense. It's easy to compare the density because the volume is consistent. But what if we take a much larger container of ice cream like this one? It weighs more, but is that simply because it's just more ice cream or is it also more dense? Well, that's why we need density and the math and calculations to figure out density. Density looks at the amount of mass something has in a given volume. So generally our volume will be consistent and we can then make it easier to compare. So let's first convert this to a consistent volume. Let's just do one cup to start. So a pint has two cups and half a gallon has eight cups. Then what we're going to do is simplify the fraction by dividing. So for example, we can take 423 grams and divide it by two cups to get a density of 216 grams per cup. Now we probably would use a scientific unit like milliliters or liters, not cups. And actually each container shows us the volume of each ice cream in milliliters or liters. So here's what this looks like if we were making our given volume in milliliters. We do the same math as more, just divide the fraction to simplify it. So the denominator is one milliliter. Now we can compare the density of each ice cream in grams per milliliter, a pretty common unit used for density. And by having this unit, we can actually compare it to other known substances like water, which has a density of one gram per milliliter. Whew, okay, so we figured out our independent variable, the amount of air in ice cream. And now let's start off with our dependent variable, texture of ice cream. We have the same exact issue here where we need to think about how are we going to make it as measurable and quantitative as possible. So we decided to focus in on scoopability and more specifically, the force needed to scoop the ice cream in Newtons. Now again, this wasn't perfect. You can see the numbers, they were a bit all over the place and it was really hard to keep the container in place without slipping. Over time, we learned that a better way to do this was to not actually try to scoop the ice cream, but just insert the scoop into the ice cream and see the force that was needed to insert the scoop. It still wasn't perfect, but it was definitely better. Our hypothesis was that the more air the ice cream has, the easier it will be to scoop because basically if the ice cream was less dense, it would require less force to push something through it. Here are our values for the amount of force just to insert the scoop into the ice cream. And this was after the ice cream had been sitting out for about two minutes. So how does air affect scoopability? Well, according to our experiment today, it definitely has an impact. And the more air the ice cream has, the easier it will be to scoop. Despite a good amount of human error and issues with getting our data, we can actually see that there's a really clear trend here. The ice creams that had the least amount of air required the most amount of force to insert the scoop into the ice cream. We also saw a huge correlation between the price of the ice cream and the amount of air. Generally, less expensive ice creams had more air, which made sense because air is free. And we could see a difference not only in the actual density and our values, but also the texture when we just looked at it qualitatively. More expensive ice creams like Ben & Jerry's or Haagen-Dazs not only were more dense, but they also looked creamier, and that was because they had less air. Additionally, low-fat or slow-churned ice creams also had more air, and that was where we saw the biggest difference. However, what we didn't hypothesize and didn't really account for is that there's a bigger factor involved, and that's temperature. The longer the ice cream sits out, the easier it's going to be to scoop, and we found that that generally had a bigger impact on how easy it was to scoop. Here you can see how easily we could just scoop out the ice cream with a spoon when the ice cream had been sitting out for a couple of minutes versus straight out of the freezer. It clearly had the biggest impact in how easy it was to scoop. This is a perfect example of a control or control variable, which is essentially a factor that might affect the dependent variable. So we need to hold it constant in the experiment so it's not influencing our results in a way that we might not expect. 
So for example, here it'd be key that we pull out all of the ice creams out of the freezer at the same time and try to measure it as quickly as possible because if we have one ice cream sitting out for five minutes, the reason it might be easier to scoop is just for the fact that the temperature is different and it's been sitting out rather than the amount of air. One of the reasons we chose this concept is because you can experiment with this and be curious about it on whatever scale you want. You can go big scale like we did today and check out tons of different ice creams and actually weigh it all out yourself. Or you can just be curious next time you're in the grocery store and wandering down the ice cream aisle. Just take a second to look at the back of the pint and you'll be able to figure it out. The other major reason we wanted to include this episode was to show you that making and designing your own experiment definitely comes with some frustrations and trials. We had to do a lot of troubleshooting and tinker with our methods to figure out what was most precise. And we still weren't 100% precise. So it's also important to note our limitations and think about where we could maybe address those gaps. And if we're not really able to address them, practically speaking, we still need to recognize them and acknowledge them. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Bite Size. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos.